Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, first, Michael, for that introduction. And obviously, thank you to everyone here for taking time out to come along this afternoon. I'd just also like to say a thank you to the KESS team as well for this opportunity to share some of the work that I've been doing. Um, so, my name is Louisa Boyle. I'm a lecturer at Belfast School of Art, which is part of Ulster University. And the title of my presentation today is Promoting Wellbeing Through Partnership and Co-Production. Um, what I'm just going to give you here is a brief overview of what I'm going to address. Obviously, it's looking at the background and um, the rationale for the projects that I've been involved in over the last um, four to five years with PIPS Charity. I've highlighted two of um, two separate activities because I felt these were a good um, overview or summary of where we feel we want to go next. The key finding from those, and again, the future focus and how maybe that Maybe there are some things that have been highlighted through the process and the findings, which I think are of real kind of meaningful um, impact to maybe future policy making or health um, initiatives. So obviously over this seminar series, there's been a number of colleagues from um, the higher education institutions throughout Northern Ireland who have talked quite extensively <coughs> on the impact of poor mental health um, on our uh, population. In particular, one of the key areas that I'm going to be looking at is really where within with young people and children. And my background or rationale for that is, as Michael outlined, I'm an artist. I've worked a lot over the past 20 odd years with communities, looking at different things to do with identity, to looking at ways of how we engage maybe disengaged groups or maybe hard to reach um, communities within communities within our society. Coupled with this, obviously, within my um, with the widening access um, agenda within HE and having more students maybe come with various different mental health requirements, it has become much more of a focus even within institutions. So within my own institution, one of our key strategies is about civic engagement. It's about looking at what is the point of what we do within university structures and how we can really use the knowledge bases and maybe the research that we are doing um, out and within the community. So, as I said, I'm going to talk about, in particular, two different collaborations um, or two different projects and really look at how we developed a partnership, what were the key considerations, synergies and modes of working within those, um, what we found has really worked and how that has kind of um, influenced our uh, recommendations. So one of the first projects we done, it was a few years ago, it was entitled A Peaceful Christmas and it was, if you like, its key aim or the influence of the design of that project was how do we get young people to start to discuss or talk about their emotional well-being. So um, one asked, and on the other side of it was from the charity's point of view was, could you design, um, look at maybe some ways in which we could design a card that may be given to families who've been bereaved by suicide, um, where obviously around Christmas wishes of best wishes and all that can cause quite a lot of um, grief. So we designed a program of activities which was um, based with two schools in North Belfast and we were very careful and mindful of the fact that obviously not knowing what kind of the wider um, social or family structures with those children who might come to those. So we were very mindful about the ethical impact of this. So we started off the project where there was an open sort of session about emotional well-being. We had counsellors on hand in case anybody wanted to share things. And then we got into looking at um, sort of the, the process. The students obviously became very aware of imagery, began talking very much through the workshops about what they hadn't realised or what they'd thought about maybe suicide or ill health or mental ill health beforehand. And I think maybe one of the key things that came out of a lot of this was a lot of them had talked about, I hadn't ever really thought about how my family would feel. There was things, there was a lot of discussions around sort of what their maybe perceptions of that this was might have been like a genuine um, route that they could go through. It seemed like it wasn't something that was particularly horrific in some senses with some of the conversations, but that this kind of um, brought a new kind of veneer, if you like, onto the conversations with them, and they began to think very differently about what happened. So following from that, and I've highlighted this project in particular, I started working with the family support group at PIPS who meet sort of once a week and are uh, members of families who've maybe been bereaved, well, who have been bereaved by 
suicide. Um, and I've lost members that way. And what we did was we started to look at what, it wasn't like a very set, here are the outcomes that are going to kind of arise out of this project. It was, if you could have, what could you, how would you have tried to reach those young people? How would you have maybe, what do you think now looking back, what did you miss, those kind of things. So what we did was we initially started working on a large textile hanging that was um, primarily to be adorned in one of the um, counselling rooms and the group were very keen that this had to be something that was very welcoming, it had to be quite powerful symbolically um, but it didn't want, they didn't want it to be overwhelmed in a sense by sadness. So the use of very bright colours of quite textural materials. They um, explored a lot of avenues about looking at the idea of the tree which is part of Pip's logo and about this cycle and sort of about regrowth and how we've, um, this, there's always going, you know, you can always kind of move on from things. Through these discussions though, one of the key things that came out was, was the use of language and how they felt, what they felt were key messages that people needed to hear. How do you talk to somebody who has just lost someone? Um, how can you kind of reach out to them or how can you reach out to somebody who is considering this as a, a genuine, if you like, route or a feasible route that they want to go down. So we kind of started, we looked at a lot of these, we talked about the conversations that they were having. The, they, the group had an awful lot of, um, if you like, ownership of the design and feel of this visual imagery. One of the key things we wanted to do as well was to um, sort of look at producing a booklet as well that would um, be given to people maybe as they just had come, maybe were first time coming to PIPS and there was a lot of stories and um, visual imagery that the group wanted included. Another notable thing was they wanted to get little business size cards printed with these images because they felt that sometimes sometimes you need something quite personal and just have that kind of thing that you can flip out but it can be quite hidden as well so if you feel the need to, for, to contact somebody. They felt it was important as well to maybe look at how this image could get out so we did pilot um, look at, um, over a few weeks in September of last year um, a bus um, routes and this it was a series of posters that were put up in the buses and went through, um, quite, as you can see, quite extensively through, throughout North and West Belfast. From all of this work, the key findings that we really started to pull out from this was that the development of any partnership really has to recognise how we utilise the experience that is already out there. If I had went with like maybe the two graphic design students I was working with and we had been given that as a brief and we'd have worked in a certain way, we would be coming at it from a completely different point of view. We might not have considered our uses of colour, we may have been not as sensitive to those things. So the user group or the groups that we were working with were so fundamental to how these things um, evolved and how our um, how outcomes were used. But in many respects that's only kind of, if you like, one facet for what we did. At this end of the day, one of the key issues that was highlighted by the Family Support Group, by Charlie, and also from a lot of the research that um, we have been kind of, is the change in social practices, especially among young people, and their use of digital, um, either online social media platforms or digital devices, and how really we can no longer kind of not really engage with this. It's very simple, you can do a very quick YouTube Google search and it took me about two or three minutes to get up these types of videos. And this is what our young people can access directly in their bedrooms, one to one. This is the kind of stuff, we, and I, this was, you know, how to cut yourself. It was a very simple Google um, search sentence I put in. And it's quite scary when you think of the accessibility of a lot of this. Obviously there has been a lot of research and work done where um, there have been suicide sort of, if you like, help or how-to websites that and a lot of um, public bodies and charities have looked at kind of developing their web listings in order that they come up first and not these other ones. But at the same time, 
this is very freely available information for our young people. And especially if you consider these, this um, is sort of my, some of my preliminary findings, looking at a lot of huge secondary or big data sets when we're looking at how young people are using phones. 13 to, this was from a, a survey that was done last year, quite a huge one in UK and Ireland. 13, the 13 to 17 year olds nowadays are getting their first phone at 12 years of age, as opposed to maybe the 18 to 24 year olds who got it at 16, the 25 to 34 year olds who got it at 20. So we are dealing with those, if you like, pockets of information being much more accessible to a much younger audience much quicker. And one of the things that came out of some of the thing was that uh, some of these younger, uh, 13 to 14, 17 years, are more likely to share their toothbrush than let you have access to their phone. And any of us who have or hang about with these people know how much of, a, of an object this is. So we have to be aware that actually engagement with this type of uh, routes of communication, vehicles of communication, is so vitally important if we're looking forward to how do we address public health issues, and especially with when you're dealing with children maybe who are as young as 10, who have these are quite savvy and who are looking at these. Other, other data that's coming out of a lot of this um, research that I've been doing at the minute, looking at sort of teenage and young children's use of digital platforms and their, kind of how that's changing their social practices, is more and more of them are watching video content online. YouTube, when they have questions about anything, when they're, they're more likely to YouTube it than Google it. And that's where this kind of, we have to be aware of how we're doing that, or oops, sorry, of how we're engaging with these kind of um, forums. So really what um, our recommendations are and where we're starting to try to see this is that yes, we can look at how we can engage with these social media platforms, but we must also be aware that we have to talk to them in the language in which that communication is going to get through. There's been a lot of study done, uh, studies done and it's more to do with, if we like, on the marketing side where huge marketing companies are trying things where they're looking at maybe expensive ads or maybe getting some teenager to do a how-to video on YouTube and actually it's usually the 14-year-old who's doing the YouTube uh, video who's getting more response and more kind of um, uh, engagement. So we have to look at how these change in digital um, practices are happening with our younger groups and if so we need to be really aware of how not only not it's not about um, policing those things but how do we engage so that those children or young people are accessing the right kind of information and really what I would be suggesting and what we've kind of um, pulled out from a lot of these is that really we need to sort of be pulling in these groups of students or children or users at all aspects, so whether it's in at the design, at the research, at the development of content, to ensure that this whatever it is that we are presenting to them um, is actually going to be much more effective. Um, thank you all very much for listening, and um, that's me. All right, thank you.